Welcome to the Leaders Playlist. In today's episode, we are speaking to John Dare. Now, John is an expert in neuroscience, emotional intelligence, and people analytics, and he helps people and organizations unlock their potential using his expertise in these areas. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining us. Let's start by you telling us the story of John. Put it in a nutshell, I guess, obviously not an Australian, but from the US. I'm an adopted Australian now living in Adelaide. I came right out of high school, really, and started my first business. So I didn't go to college and um, ended up going back and getting my MBA in my 50s when I turned 50. But I was born in Panama, uh, moved to the U.S. uh, when I was very young. So mostly raised there uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, So that was kind of my upbringing and did a lot of um, startups uh, in my early career. Um, from there, turned uh, venture capitalist for a couple of years, uh, did some interim CEO stuff. And then I started a uh, management consulting practice and we did organizational transformation work in Fortune 500s for about 10 years. And that's where I really started to get passionate about kind of organizational um, psychology and including you know trust and psychological safety were big factors in that. And so um, then I met an Adelaide girl and so here I am uh, in Australia. So that's that's the, the short version of the story of John, I think. <laughs> How long did you spend in Panama? Um, not long. Um, I think uh, my mom and dad got divorced. And so my mom and my brother and I went to the U.S. when I was probably four and then went back to Panama every summer until, um, until I was out of high school. So I was there for three or four months a year, usually. <laughs> Do you have a favorite? Rum, Panama rum. I do have a favorite rum. My favorite, well, I now I've got two, but my favorite Panama rum is Abuelo. Uh, and I was raised on the cheaper version of that that they make <laughs> called Rum Cortez. Because there's no drinking age in Panama. So <laughs> it was that. <laughs> What's the other one? Oh, is that, that was the, oh, the other one is is, uh, is Ron uh, Zacapa, which, yeah. uh, which is very nice. Yeah. Very nice. That's, so hold on, let me get let me get back to that. There's no drinking age in Panama. <laughs> no, there's no drinking age. No. So I mean, literally, when I was, you know, young, like a thir- like 13, 14 year old, we we grew up racing things, and so we had these um, little motorcycles. And we'd literally, this is a true story, chase iguanas through the sawgrass in Panama in the jungles, <laughs> and um, then you'd come across a thatched roof thing with four um, trees sticking in the ground, holding it up. And, you know, this shake, you know, shaky looking bar inside and <laughs> we'd go in there and buy Panama beer for a nickel for a 10 ounce bottle or a dime for a 20 ounce bottle <laughs> and get back on our little bikes and <laughs> race around. <laughs> I was probably 13. <laughs> I think my child has been robbed somehow. Yeah. Just, uh, chasing iguanas <laughs> through jungle. Literally. <laughs> it was a great childhood, honestly. <laughs> that is awesome. Very cool. <laughs> Our topic today is trust. And you mentioned in your story how you began to take a little bit more interest in trust and psychological safety. What does trust mean to you? Trust is an emotion, which most people don't think of it that way, but trust is actually an emotion that builds between two people. And um, in the context of organizational work, well, or even, even as an individual, I suppose, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, trust is a primary emotion that, that helps us discern if we're safe or not safe. So we're wired for safety as human beings. And um, and this is the emotion that actually tells us if we're in a situation where we're safe or not. And we do that through a word called trust is what, is what we call it, right? And so people that we trust, we're able to be more open and, and free with. And people that we don't trust, um, we close down. I think when you really think about what trust is, then it's actually essential. And it's a, it's a key part of every relationship that we have and every single thing that we do. How important is trust in creating a psychology safety? So one way to think about it is that um, psychological safety is the environment, right? So you can think of, think of a culture, even like in, within an organization. So it's the environment that we're in and trust is the, is this emotion between two people. So psychological safety then really is a is a term that I believe Amy Edmondson, uh, who's a professor at Harvard University, came up with uh, in her research. She's been uh, studying that for about twenty years now, and really speaking to it in the sense that do you feel safe in 
your environment to be able to speak up, to actually play full out, make mistakes and not feel that there's some type of retribution or that you're going to be you know, harmed or humiliated in some way within the organization, within your team. This actually, I think, is, a, is, a, is where the real the challenge in organizations comes in around this, this whole topic, because we're moving from command and control, authoritative leadership or power over leadership um, and, and primary leader by title, right? Not leader by action, but leader by title. And that is based on fear and intimidation. And so leaders that are more authoritative uh, leaders actually induce fear and intimidation. That actually releases cortisol in our brain, which creates anxiety. So this is this is a massive issue. We're transitioning to some new type of leadership, and everybody's trying to kind of coin that. I've heard empathetic or empathic leadership, social leadership, authentic leadership, conscious leadership. I mean, there's just all kinds of them names of them, but they're all trying to define leadership styles that are um, power with styles, where we're actually enabling people um, to perform. And this, uh, if, if we look at it from a neuroscience perspective, is actually, for me, it's fascinating. For more, most, many people, it's probably boring, but it's, it's interesting because those types of leadership styles actually build trust. They release oxytocin in the brain, which is the hormone of trust and love, trust and relationships, and allow employees to actually flourish. And I mean, literally, not only does it increase performance, it increases well-being. There's actually a 62% correlation, which is an absolute direct correlation between the level of trust in an organization and performance output, right? So there's an absolute correlation. Um, yet we still see organizations struggling uh, to make this transition or leaders struggling to make this transition. And it's, it can be a, a generational thing that's happening, but it's also that under stress, we go to what we know. This probably started about three or four or five years ago, but then you know, the pandemic hits and everybody's in crisis mode. And so the, the, just the fear and uncertainty that that's all created um, has created massive mental health challenges um, across the board. And leaders have really gone into kind of self-protection and kind of a fight mode, if you will, right? And so that's been a, I think it's actually detracted from our ability to make uh, a more rapid shift in leadership styles globally. So it's been, I think it's been a real issue for us. Yeah, it's been a bit of a, bit of a whirlwind eight in one, hasn't it? And okay, I've seen a bit of a, wow. a reaction to that in leadership. And, just kind of curious to know like, how, how important is it to build that connection as a leader with your direct reports or your teams to, to be able to kind of help with that trust? I, I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, it, it's interesting. Um, there's a guy named Edelman who does a, a annual survey, global survey, and he breaks it down by country, by region, um, and then at the global level, of course, and uh, all about trust, measuring trust. And he measures it across four domains. Um, he looks at media, trust in media, trust in education, trust in government, and trust in corporates. And what was really interesting about the 2021 report is that it showed that people are looking to corporate leadership to solve social problems, right? So looking at corporate leadership to solve social problems. That's the first time that that's ever happened. It says that people are looking at government and uh, educational institutions um, and media as more untrustworthy to start with, right? So their trust is declining and not able to actually take action for change, which is not surprising when you really think about it. I mean, the, the, the media has been you know, really hammered from a trust perspective. Uh, governments are so polarized now that they can't get anything done. And much of the media is following suit down political lines. And so the trust with media. So there's really only one place that we go to, you know, most every day in a, in a structure that can actually take action. And that's our, our businesses, our corporations. And so they're looking to corporations for change, um, which you know, gives you probably even more power to them than they, they probably need. Um, so I think there's some really good things about it, or, you know, you could say some, some challenging things. Have you seen similar things? I mean, when you think about it, sit back and think about it, can you kind of see how that might play out? 
Yeah, I'm kind of interested in where you're going with that. That you know, you know, it would probably be the other way around a couple of years ago. I no one trusted the corporations to take the banks and whatever else after the um sub subprime stuff. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I don't know if uh, is it the the Amazon, the Bezos, and and the Elon Musk that they're, they're looking for these guys to save it, or is it your corporation, your local leader? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure I've seen it. I think, yeah, yeah, well, I, I think, um. I think where you'll have seen it is you'll have seen it in the support behind um, specific social challenges like Black Lives Matter, as an example, or um, even around um, um, you know um, gay rights and so forth. Apple comes to mind. I mean, Apple. Um, I mean, they were absolutely in the forefront of you know sponsoring the gay rights parade in in San Francisco for I mean years back even. Uh, Tim Cook, actually, who's the CEO, um, is is um, is gay, and so I think they've been a real advocate, and rightfully so. The other th- and they and they've done very similar things. They and they've supported their people um, in the middle of the pandemic. Pandemic hits. Um, they continued, even though they closed all their stores, they continued to pay all their employees. So I mean, think about the cost of that, right? They paid all of their employees full salaries. Or full pay, even if they were hourly employees, and they did that um, because it um, it was the right thing to do. And so, you you there are situations where you see that. I think you know, aside from the the, the space race that's that's going on uh, between a couple of them, you know, I think Bezos even has done a lot of really um, philanthropic things. Um, and you can make you know judgment around um, Gates at this point, but uh, the Gates Foundation has um, done you know, massive work in social environments. And um, and some of the impact I think that they're having on the world is um, is much greater than any the media education or government. Think about technology. There is probably no time in history that somewhere around 50 people, technology people, that literally worked in three technology companies in Silicon Valley changed the world the world that we know today, right? The communication functionality, right? The fact that we're even on this call right now together is a, is a factor of that. Technology has um, absolutely brought tremendous value to the world. Absolutely, we do not know how to manage it. Governments do not know how to regulate it. And there are some shadow shadows that it creates that we need to learn how to manage, especially as AI starts to enter. And this all can impact us negatively. When we think about trust and psychological safety, the biggest fear that people have today in organizations is the fear of irrelevance because of this, right? For the same reason. So I think in, like anything else, you know, the things that really are provide a lot of value also bring shadows to them. And I think this is this is probably no different than that. So yeah, but it, it's a great report. If you if you haven't seen it, um, I'd say go read the Edelman report. Quite interesting. I just wanted to go back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, we're shifting from those leaders that are authoritative or, you know, rule by fear and intimidation. And before COVID, you were starting to see a shift in that. What was that shift that you were starting to see? Well, I think we started to see people coming out and talking more about it. And um, it became a thing. I know in the work that we've been doing, um, it's been a primary focus for us as well. And we've been getting a lot of larger organizations pulling us in for this very thing to try to help make that shift. And we use um, emotional intelligence uh, and neuroscience to do that. So, and, and, I, and that's been on the increase, especially then during COVID, obviously, then that has tremendously impacted workforces and leadership. We've been um, working to a point where we've got burnout ourselves now, and so we're we took a, a real big holiday um, over over the uh, holiday season here, and uh, tried to rejuvenate ourselves a bit so that we could you know you know get back in and, and fight the fight for it. But I think that's probably the majority. There's a there's a uh, there's a guy that um, now I'll have a, I'll have a senior moment. Forget his name, who I think kind of led the charge on this. He was. Um, I'm hoping I'm getting his name for the, it's John, ah, I'm forgetting it now. Uh, but he was the C, he was the CEO at eBay. He did the turnaround at eBay uh, originally and probably the most authentic leader um, that I've ever met 
he did a phenomenal job there. And he is uh, probably the furthest thing from an authoritative leader as you could get. And then he went on now, I think he's the CEO at Nike now. So you said he was one of the more, most authentic leaders you've ever met. What were some of the qualities? What What makes you say that about him? You know, I think a lot of it, when you start thinking about um, building psychological safety in an organization, or I mean, for that matter, even trust in um, relationship. It, this is really interesting. There, there are certainly things that you could point to, right? Um, but I'll, I'll play this out for you. So as an example, what are the, have we set kind of clear boundaries on how we're going to work together, right? Is that sitting there? Are we reliable, right? Do we, do we walk the talk, right? Um, and I, th- I think that's probably more important than anything else. Do we have accountability? Are we holding each other accountable to things? And it's not, that doesn't mean that you, you, it's a blame game when somebody doesn't meet a deadline or meet a KPI. It's about assuming they're doing the best they can and can we get alongside them and help them be successful, right? So it's always in the how when you start talking about accountability. Um, do we, is, is there confidentiality? Do we only talk about things that are ours to share, right? This is a big one. This is the whole thing you see in a lot of organizations now that have back channeling in them. Judgment, are we, no, are we non-judgmental or are we in judgments of a judgment of others? Um, generosity, are we generous with our interpretation of things that transpire that we see, right? Which links to the judgment thing. Those are all kind of primary factors in, in building um, trust. And there are primary factors in authentic leadership. Um, leaders get in a difficult position because a lot of times they have to make a bad decision and, um, and they're really trying to choose be, which decision is worse. So they make the, the, the least bad decision that they can make um, based on the circumstances. You know, if you, had a, if you have a, a situation, uh, and, this, and I think COVID has brought this up uh, in a number of ways, in a number of situations, um, and you think about some of the politicians that are having to navigate this, and they have to come out and make a decision about things that are going to hurt one sector or another for the greater good of the, the economy, as an example. Um, but that plays out in our in our corporations every day, where they're having to make a decision that's going to that's going to hurt one part of the organization, so that we actually the, the full organization actually can prosper. And so, um, if you can be transparent in those times. And, and speak authentically about them, um, I think that brings a lot of value to it. Now, now that I've said all of that, right, now I'll put that all in challenge. So we talk about reliability, we talk about accountability. Tell me if you don't have this person in your life. My best friend in, in the world um, is, is a guy that um, I grew up with. And I, tr- I would trust him with anything. I would trust him with my kid. I would trust him you know, with my life, honestly. He's probably the most irresponsible person you'll ever meet. He's never done one thing he said he would do, right? He'll, he'll t- tell me stories about others that he shouldn't be telling me. I mean, all the things that I just called out, right? All the things I just called out. But do you not have somebody in your life like that? Yet you trust the person. I'd say when I would say it would be me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the most reliable person. <laughs> and then the question is, is, is why? Why, do you, why is that trust there? I have to ask Renee. You're assuming that I trust you. Maybe. I am. <laughs> <laughs> One way to think about it is that, um, I, and, and we'll play it off with the two of you then, I would bet you, Dave, that if you were in trouble and you really needed help, that Renee would be there to help you. Yeah, she'd probably pay me out for it, but yeah, no, she'd help. I'd help first, and then you'd never hear the end of it after yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but and that's that's the thing, right? Was that person? Does that person have my back? Yeah. We literally, and and this is interesting. It, it you think about like first impressions um, are the most important, right? Within less than three seconds, when you meet someone, your brain is. Com- absolutely evaluating if this is someone that will care for me or care about me and are they competent because if they're not competent it doesn't matter if they would care for me or not they won't be able to in the end right so our brain is interpreting and evaluating those two factors and this is why leaders authenticity is critically important 
this is why we, we, one of the leading kind of terminologies around this new leadership is empathic leadership is because people that will care for others, they have, they have a stronger connection. They connect with people very quickly. And as a consequence, if they have the competence in their job, which they probably wouldn't be in that position if they didn't, um, that combined with the empathy, people want to follow them, right? I mean, that's the easiest way to say it. People will follow them. It's funny in, in a lot of, um, I do a lot of executive coaching with, um, with CEOs and um, many of them have lower empathy. I, I have lower, I, I like to say I'm, I'm empathetically challenged. It, it, low empathy, by the way, is a measurement of people that are uncomfortable with emotional vulnerability. It's not that they don't care, right? So that's kind of a myth to break right up front. It isn't that people don't care, it's that they are, they are uncomfortable with emotional vulnerability. So the person's uncomfortable with emotional vulnerability, but their view then is, is that it's easier for me to make hard decisions if I have to let people go or make one of those bad decisions, it's easier for me to do that if I don't, if I don't, if I have lower empathy, I can protect myself, I can compartmentalize that. Um, and then my response is always, well, that's the coward's way out. Because if you're making a decision that's actually gonna hurt people, you actually need to understand and feel the implications of that. And that's, and so we coach to that because um, you wanna make decisions that, and you understand what the impact of those decisions are gonna be. Otherwise, you know, you get into situations which we, we, we've all seen on the news with some of those corporations you were talking about earlier today. I, I just find this area fascinating because um, it, it, as soon as you think you really have it nailed down, there's always an exception to the rule. Do, you, do, I, do I have time to kind of go through one quick thing with you on this? Do, do a little challenge with you? So, sure. all right. I want you to, <laughs> and the listeners can do this too. I want you to, you know, because you guys are both on this together, you can use initials or an emblem if, if it's one of you. I want you to think of one or two people that you absolutely do not trust. Absolutely do not trust them. Wouldn't trust them with anything. And then I want you to think of one or two people that you would trust with your life. You would trust them with your kids. Now, when you think about the people that you absolutely do not trust, what are the behaviors that caused you not to trust them? What comes up for you? Breaking trust. They break your trust? Yeah. How do they do that? Um, by, uh, like you said before, sharing stories or telling people things that you don't want repeated. Yep. What else? And you and you say you don't want them repeated, but they do it yeah, anyway. But they do it anyways. Dave, got any? Why do those people think of those people? Why do you not trust them? I go back to your point. I think it's that you know three second thing. I just when I met them, I just went, oh my gut tells me this is not a person who has any my interest anywhere in their zone. I'm not even on their spectrum. Like that's like they have yeah. no zero because zero care factor for me. Yeah. It's more of all about them. You can tell yeah. straight away. Um, but you could go on. You could say that, you know, they're not reliable. They, you know, they don't do what they say they're going to do. Everything's about them right? and rather than about me, right? They're narcissistic. I mean, there's all these things that come up, right? What about the people you do trust? What is it about them that would make you trust them so much? You know, they have your back. They have your back. They're there when you need them. If they're there when you need them, yeah. What else? They just take time to listen. They show an interest in, in yeah. you. Listen. Yeah, and they show interest. Here's the thing that's, that is interesting about this. So think about those people you don't trust. If they were on the podcast with us right now, would, would they have put you in that same, would their, your initials be down there? Would they view you the same way that you view them? That's a no for me. You don't think they would view you the same way? No. It's a tricky one. Yeah, no, I don't think that my name would be down there. You don't think your name would be on there? No. I would bet you money it would be because trust is an emotion that builds between two people. So if you don't trust them, they're not going to trust you. It's very unlikely that they would trust you. And the other thing that's interesting about it is that if they were on this call with us right now, would they say the same things that you're saying of the people that they think are untrustworthy and trustworthy and the whole thing? Would they think they're trustworthy? Because I'd say, do you think you're trustworthy? Of course. Well, they would think they're trustworthy too. 
It, it's it's an yeah. interesting thing. It's an interesting dynamic. So trust then starts to, it's based on our own interpretation. Everything's coming through our own filters and you're perceiving their actions as untrustworthy and they may not. Mm. In fact, you know, it, uh, when you talk about gossip or saying things that really aren't their stories to share, many times it, what really plays out is this. I'm trying to build trust with Dave. So I go to Dave and I go, Dave, did you know that, that Renee's actually been drinking on the job? Did you know that? Right? Yep, I did. You did? <laughs> yeah. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows, everyone knows right? It's normally wrong. Uh, so now when I walk away, do you trust me more or less? Because I've shared that with you. You know, I'd have to say I wouldn't because I'd be going. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? Because you're going to think is that the next time I go talk to someone else, I'm going to say, hey, you know what's going on with Dave? Right? So the, the act of trying to build trust with you that way actually diminishes trust. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So it's a very interesting um, emotion to talk about. Um, and then when you start to build that into a, all this stuff going on inside of an organization, it is very complex. You've got people that have relationships that they grew up together and they're in the same company or on the same sports team, or they like the same sports team. They're jealous of this other person because they got this job. I mean, all of this stuff is playing out um, inside these organizations. And so building psychological safety, while it sounds easy sitting here talking on, on a podcast, is actually a very um, challenging intervention. And um, it takes um, structure and leadership commitment um, to do it. So what advice would you give a person who is, I guess, new to a leadership role and you've been asked to work with them and you can see that their trustworthiness isn't great or their, their behaviors aren't helping to build that psychological safe environment? What, what sort of advice would you give them? There's probably two, two factors to it. One, and it gets back to that same exercise we just did. Uh, there's trustworthiness and then there's trust willingness. And as a leader, we have to have trust willingness because if we, if we are one of those people that sits back and says, well, I'll trust them when they show me I can trust them and they prove to me that I can trust them. Well, to start with that's judgment. But secondly, you might be waiting forever because it's an emotion that grows between two people. And if you're not willing to trust them, they're not going to be willing to trust you. And so you have to be, have trust willingness as you step into the job. Uh, the second thing I would say is that we there's a direct correlation between the level of trust you have with your team and the level of performance output that you will provide. And so you need to focus on trust. And if, if that isn't an anchor enough to, to start doing the actions that are necessary to be trustworthy, then um, then I'd probably coach them on more personal impact things that they've got. But um, because if, if it's if it's an issue within an organization or in your leadership, it is going to be an issue in your personal life. And so um, there's other things going on there. But I think that those are probably the things I coach from anyways. As you know, John, this is the Leaders Playlist. So we ask each of our guests to name a song that helps them get in that mindset or whatever it needs to be for whatever the, to the topic is. But today's topic being trust. What's your go-to song when, yeah. you, when you want to build trust? For me, the, to build trust takes authenticity. And so you've got to be who you are, right? You're not going to fake it. We have, a, we have mirror neurons that if we try to fake it, people feel the incongruency. So... We have to be authentic. So mine is my authentic music. I love uh, the the seventies uh, and and early eighty rock stuff. I love Fleetwood Mac, so it'd be uh, Landslide by Fleetwood Mac, but preferably sang by what's now known as the Chicks or the Dixie Chicks, right? <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> That's just better than uh, than uh, than Fleetwood Mac did, but, but I love both of them. So that'd be my favorite song. Dave, what's yours? I haven't heard that song, or maybe I have, can't remember it. Oh, you, you would have heard it. I'm going to have to research that one. Yeah, my one I'd had, I'd actually is sung by two people as well, strangely enough. One, I think, in the 70s and one in the 80s. Lean On Me, and it was Club Nouveau, I had it in the 80s. And Bill Willis, I think, is the guy that sang in the 70s, maybe even 60s, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, that's just that lean on me that, you know, I'll be there for you and then you'll be there for me in the times when I need to lean on you. So that's yeah. that I've gone Captain Obvious and gone with Matter of Trust by Billy Joel. <laughs> because I think, I don't know, when I think of the word trust, that's the first song that comes to my mind anyway. So just I just start singing it in my head. 
I shall be adding that one to the playlist. We've started a playlist, John. So on Spotify, there's a leader's playlist playlist of all of the songs that our guests have said. So we'll add, I'll add these to the, I'll add both landslides. It's an um, eclectic collection of songs, isn't it? It is. It's, it's a really <laughs> weird playlist, but you know, it's the thought that counts. You can stick it on shuffle. It'll be fine. What book are you reading at the moment, John? Uh, two, actually. One would be Fearless Organizations by Amy Edmondson. And the second would be um, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety, and that's by Timothy Clark. Bit of a theme going there. What's your favorite smell, John? Oh, I should be saying my wife when we're out on a date, but uh, probably bacon (laughs) (laughs) cooking. (laughs) I don't know. The two of those together just don't sound right either. So. It's a tough choice, mate. It's a tough choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bacon always smells better when someone else is cooking it true. as well. John, as, as a kid, uh, what was your favorite toy? That would rum. Either, that would either be my mo- yeah, rum. That would either be my <laughs> motorcycle or it would be a fishing rod. But probably I'll say a fishing rod because I, I still am very passionate about fishing and I've given up the racing thing quite a while ago. What TV show are you currently binging? Oh, uh, binging would be uh, Ozark on Netflix. Yeah, there's a few of them that I really like, but, but yeah, that, that's full on. <laughs> so the end of the world is coming. What's the last thing that you do? Make damn sure that everybody that I really love knows it. You know, one of my favorite things to say when I'm working is that at the end of the day, they're putting us all in a box. And the only thing that's going to matter at that point is those people standing around the box. All the rest of this is just noise. That is so true. Mm. Wow. Pretty deep as well. (laughs) Um, With rum. With rum. Well, thank you, John. It was awesome conversation. We really enjoyed it. Thank you for joining. Well, it was certainly a pleasure. And thank you so much for the opportunity. 